Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of Wow's Alive with our guest, John Scott. Welcome. Thank you, Stephen, very much. Uh, happy to be here. Yes, and uh, you're a lifelong swimmer. So you start out in the pool and then you got into open water. Can you sort of give us a 30,000 view of your swimming career? Well, thanks. It's a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Um, when I was 13, which is a bit late for some people to start competitive swimming, I joined uh, a club in Toronto, showed up and um, didn't really know what I was doing. The coach asked me what my best stroke was. And the only thing I could think of was breaststroke. <laughs> so I was in the breaststroke lane for a while until we figured out that wasn't working. And then I evolved uh, into, uh, well, freestyle and swam on some uh, relay teams that were pretty successful. And that evolved into some longer distance. I enjoyed the 400 and particularly the 1500. But uh, so through my career uh, in competitive swimming, I was able to uh, manage through uh, a pretty good 50 through to a pretty good 1500. Oh, wow, that's, that's very unusual. What were, yeah. what were some of your hardest workouts that you remember? Well, yeah, thanks. One workout um, that came to mind when we were talking prior to the recording was uh, my coach at one time came in and I was in the distance lane predominantly towards the end of my career. And he said, okay, it's a long course. So it's okay, uh, guys, uh, let's do 10,000 straight. Uh, in you go, work the turns, build it, negative split, and I'll see you in a couple hours. So that was, that was one. Um, and as an age grouper, did you just say, yes, sir, and start at the 60, or what was the? Well, um, boy, you're asking some good questions. Yeah, basically, uh, at the height of my competitive swimming career, I was swimming 11 workouts a week, um, plus dry land stuff. And uh, pretty much it was, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> one, um, one year, I won an award for not missing one workout in a, in a whole oh, wow. swimming season, which I was pretty proud of. But uh, yeah, I worked hard and did what I was told and uh, until uh, master swimming came along when my first workout in master swimming lasted 20 minutes and the guy said, hey, where are you going? The workout's not over. And I said, yeah, it is for me. <laughs> and he said, why? And I said, because I can. <laughs> yeah. Because I can choose to walk out. And uh, once I knew that I had that sort of freedom and control, then I went, when I went in all, all in. So um, anyways, that's, uh, yeah, the competitive swimming background was, there's a lot of work and a lot of big workouts. And uh, and I really enjoyed that time. Uh, had a lot of fun, met a lot of great people. Yeah, what, what, when, you know, when I hear of an age group swimmer, uh, you know, competitive swimmer, um, certain things come to mind, you know, time management, because you're going to school, you know, you're obviously going to morning workout before you went to school, you did afternoon workout, you probably did homework and, right. and you do that day after day. What are, what are some characteristics, characteristics that you think are developed when, you know, you have that lifestyle as a youth? Well, thanks. So, um, well, I had to manage all that. You're right. And I don't remember thinking too much about it. It just seemed to evolve from, from necessity. I, I wanted to swim, I wanted to work out, I wanted to attend the workouts, I also wanted to do my homework. So really what I would do is uh, morning workout, I'd get up early, go to the pool, come back, have something to eat, go to school. After school, I would uh, probably do a little bit of homework, go to the, go to the uh, club, come back, finish some homework and go to bed. So Fortunately or unfortunately, at the time, there wasn't a lot of technology, so uh, I wasn't distracted too much. I knew what I had to get done, and I, I got it done. So, yeah. You know. Did you, was there a break between your competitive swimming career and then the start of your master's swimming career? Yeah, there was, uh, Stephen, and it was interesting. I don't know if other swimmers felt this way, but there was a point at which uh, my last swim meet, um, I was in the change room after uh, the the relays, which typically are at the end of a swim meet. I was at a Canadian national event and I was standing in the showers with some, with a couple guys and I looked at my friend, I said, I'm done. And he said, what do you mean you're done? And I said, well, I'm, I think I'm done. I'm finished swimming. Yeah. So that was it. And then I took a few years off. I began a career, you know, just 
wanted to be finished with all the structure and all the coaching and being told what to do and the hard work. Uh, but eventually I found my way back to uh, master swimming, which, which uh, was the right time to come back. I felt good about coming back. I didn't feel forced. And I really, really enjoyed uh, the master swimming on my own terms. Yeah. And when did open water swimming sort of start? Yeah, so the open water swimming was uh, kind of a fluke of coincidence, uh, I guess. Um, I'd been uh, at work building a career and a friend of mine, um, I was swimming masters at the time. Somebody I knew said, hey, how'd you like to be a, a, a pacer on a, a swim across Lake Erie? And I said, you know, well, what does a pacer do? And he said, well, you get in and swim with them a bit. And I said, well, yeah, I can do that. So I did. This guy had a lot of heart, but didn't have a strong swimming background, but did a double crossing of Lake Erie, which is about, um, I think it was about, uh, I don't know, 12 miles each way at that, at that part. Anyways, he made it out of pure heart and inspiration. It was great. So that was sort of my introduction to uh, marathon swimming, if you will, yeah. uh, from master swimming and, uh, and I, you know, an interesting lesson, like a lot of people might find, I see somebody else do something, say, boy, if they can do it, maybe I can do it. So after this guy successfully completed Lake Erie, I thought, well, geez, maybe, maybe I could swim Lake Ontario. And my mindset at the time was, well, okay, if I'm going to do it, I might as well go big. So I thought, well, you know, um, why don't I see if I can break a world record? So I put in place that process to uh, to try to break a world record for swimming across Lake Ontario, which is 32 miles or 51 kilometers. And and how did it go that first attempt? Well, the first attempt in 91, we swam into a big storm. Lake Ontario, for those viewers, is a very big lake. It's obviously a great lake. It looks like an ocean when you're out in it. And you can't see, you know, any shore line when you're in the middle of it. So the waves were eight to 10 feet high uh, when we finished and uh, in a trough, I couldn't see the top of the mast of a sailboat, for instance. Um, so that ended <laughs> and um, didn't make it. So um, I thought that was a failure actually. Okay. What was your mindset as, as you're going up and down the wave and getting tossed left and right? What, what were you thinking? Yeah, so I was thinking of uh, keeping moving toward my goal, frankly. Uh, boats were a bit askew and I could tell things were not going well for the crew. But I just thought, you know, um, hey, I can swim. I didn't feel really at risk, actually. Okay. I just thought I'm going to keep going until somebody says something. So kind of keep, keep my head down, stay low, keep moving. Um, but eventually they said, look, this isn't working. So you got to get out. Yeah. And they, they tell you, come over, you got to get on the boat. You get on the boat and, you know, for a lot of channel and marathon swimmers, everybody's got a diff different emotions and different things that go to your head when you, they finally put a towel around you. What was, what was going through your mind at that point? Well, the truth of it is um, that, uh, yeah, I got out, got in the Zodiac, got in the boat, got a towel around me and then had a big cry. Yeah. Actually. And um I think the cry was from a sense of thinking that was a failure, uh, an emotional release. Everybody had come together to help me. Um, but the learning lesson there, Stephen, was I started to think about failure afterwards. And I thought, well, you know, failure would be not trying again. Um, and then I thought, wait a minute, uh, you know, I was in eight to 10 foot waves and, yeah. you know, um, in fact, a funny thing is there is a 65 year old woman who made the swim that summer in nice conditions and somebody came up to me and said, hey, John, how come you didn't make the swim? That's, there's a 65 year old woman who made it. How come you didn't? And uh, anyways, I let, let that slide off my back and knew that uh, the conditions weren't right for a successful crossing or, or safe for anybody. Yeah. That yeah. But now for viewers who don't know you, you did come back big time. You made it successful and, you, and you've helped lots of other people succeed in addition. Yeah, thank you. So I, I did come back um, the next year and I um, 
swam a time of 14 hours and 50 minutes, and that was uh, for fa fastest Canadian time. It was the fastest uh, amateur time in uh, pretty difficult conditions, actually. So I felt really great about that. And then two years later, I went 14.42 uh, in some conditions which were mostly good, but towards the end, it was difficult and um, felt great about that. Two years older and uh, a little faster. And um, so uh, that was that was uh, great, yeah. Yeah, and then you've helped 15, 16, 17 other people, including some disabled swimmers. Yeah, I've helped people. I like giving back. I like the coaching mentoring space where I share my experience. Um, and in this case, I helped, I've helped. i helped a lot of people across as a swim master, a coach mentor. Um, I'll tell you the most um, profound experience I had, Stephen, was, um, and I'm going to be embarrassed for a moment that I've just um, forgotten her name. Maybe it'll come to mind, but there was a quadruple amputee who wanted to swim across Lake Erie, and I was the uh, judge to do a trial swim to make sure she was um, sort of able to do it in my Ashley. opinion. Ashley. Ashley. Ashley Cohen. Ashley Cohen. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, anyways, uh, I failed her on her trial swim because uh -huh. I didn't think that she was able to do it. So uh, unlike the rules, maybe I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you come back next week, um, try it again, I'll be here. And uh, so she did, and she completely nailed it. It was amazing, unbelievable. Uh, she improved her stroke and a few other things, and uh, so I passed her. And then she went on to swim across Lake Ontario or Lake Erie, um, quadruple amputee, wow. had uh, had part of her part of all of her limbs amputated through disease when she was young. And uh, tell you what, um, whenever I sort of question one's ability or human potential, I think back to Ashley, and I think, oh my gosh. Uh, you know, she was uh, a real uh, incredible person. Yeah. And because you've been a swim master for so many swims across uh, Lake Ontario, again, Lake Ontario, one of the famed swimming venues around the world. What, when you're planning a swim, you, you have a swim window, what are you looking for? I mean, is it wind that is the big issue? Is it water temperature? What are the what are the factors that come into choosing a particular swim? Date? You're right. There's yeah. There's a few swims with Lake Ontario. Um, there are some currents to be aware of. Uh, it's a long swim, so looking ahead to weather conditions, uh, finding that window, as you say, is important. Um, water temperature. Um, it's funny when you're looking at from Niagara on the uh, Niagara on the Lake, which is across very close to the United States, right. just across the Niagara River. When you look north to Toronto, um, they say that if you can see Toronto, which is 32 miles away, then you shouldn't go because that means there's enough wind that it's blowing the smog away from Toronto. So um, uh, anyways, um, so there's a few factors, but basically you're looking for a window with reasonable conditions, um, currents that aren't too, uh, aren't going to be too challenging and then uh, you know just getting in the water and, uh, and going for it. Yeah wow I, I wouldn't have, I would have guessed if I could see it I could swim there but that's right <laughs> yeah so I mean uh, some conditions if it's just sort of overcast and uh, you know quiet and you can't see Toronto it sort of may indicate sort of a calmer weather pattern um, but anyways yeah it's a big lake and uh, it's a lot of water out there, um, and there are some serious um, serious currents coming um, out of a big river that's around Toronto. So when there's a storm, for instance, there's a lot of water that would flow out the river into the oh, I see. Into okay. Toronto and uh, really uh, could potentially take you off course. Got it. Got it. So you're essentially swimming into that river that is embedded in the lake. Yeah, you're swimming uh, into uh, some currents for sure. And uh, usually in the Toronto Harbor or around the Toronto area, there's some currents that really swirl around and mix up the cold water. As you oh, know, okay. there's, there's not really a lot of um, warm water. Uh, so if 
the current's moving around, uh, you're likely to hit some cold water and uh, that can be a challenge too. Yeah, wow. But you, yeah. you've done it, you've had a history of helping uh, disabled swimmers. And then I, I know that you were the chairman of the Special Olympics uh, Winter World Games. How was that experience? Well, that was, um, that was an amazing experience that uh, Special Olympics, as you know, is for uh, the games for mentally challenged athletes. And what happened on my swim, um, I raised about $80,000 for Special Olympics. It was a charity of my choice that time. And just by crazy coincidence, um, all of the team managers and the coaches were meeting at a, at a hotel on the waterfront, about two hotels down from where we had a reception after my swim. And they heard on the news that there was some guy who just raised some money <laughs> and they somebody listened and found out that he was at the hotel next door. So they actually kind of walked down the harbor front to the, the hotel and walked into our reception and, and uh, introduced themselves. And they invited me to be the honorary head coach for the uh, 1993 Special Olympics World Winter Games in Austria, which I, um, which I eagerly uh, and gratefully accepted. And that began the journey to bring the 1997 oh, okay. Special Olympics World Winter Games to Toronto um, four years, four years after that, which we did, and that was deemed to be the best uh, games ever, and uh, a tremendous uh, sense of uh, pride and um, and connection with these athletes, which are awesome people. Yeah, and uh, I have a little bit of experience with the uh, Special Olympics International. It runs this thing. Can you can you describe this multidisciplinary international event? I mean, it's it's a lot larger than a lot of people imagine. Right, so the, the, um, there's the Summer Games, Winter Games. The, we did a Winter Games, and there was uh, about 1,800 athletes from 60 countries. And if, you start, if I start to think about 60 countries, I can name maybe three or four that might treat um, mentally challenged people in a way that we'd all like to feel they should be treated. I guess my point is that there are some conditions these athletes have come from that aren't all that, uh, you know, been tough for them. And uh, anyways... Yeah, so we had downhill skiing, cross country skiing, um, 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 hockey, and a few other uh, sports. So it was, um, I think there's five sports. So it was, it was um, a great event, a lot of fun. And uh, I will tell you if I have time, the reason I got it, like, I picked Special Olympics not really knowing exactly. And I thought, well, I better go to a Special Olympics swim meet just to say that I've been to a games. To add credibility to my fundraising efforts, and uh, so I sat in the stands at a swim meet, and I had my notepad, and my my stopwatch, and I was going to see how fast these guys are. And I found myself um, having another cry <laughs> at the emotion that was evident in the swim pool, swimming pool. hadn't hadn't started my stopwatch, and I realized that what I was emotional about was the, just the amazing sense of camaraderie, everything that was awesome about sport, everything is like inspirational and amazing about sport was there blowing a roof off. And some of the competitive edge, the things that are a bit nasty about sports sometimes were actually just completely um, um, absent. And what was left was this rich, wonderful, inspiring experience of athletes competing because they just love to compete. And we're super grateful to have the platform to compete and um, I just said, I'm all in. And uh, it was so exciting. Yeah, yeah. I, when I saw the uh, 2011 um, Summer uh, World Games, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, the purity of spirit, yeah. the, the authenticity, the genuine um, co competitiveness, not only, you know, of themselves, but also their peers, but there was no loser. There was no one right. that actually lost there everybody right. finished and they won <laughs> and yeah. it, just, it was it's it's unparalleled i think in in sport in that way yeah. well i think you're right and i've just got shivers on my spine thinking about this and and you're so right about the purity the piece that i didn't tell you about my ex, my experience there was i was watching this uh i don't know what it was 100 freestyle or something that, that finished 
And the winner um, waited for the person who came uh, last and reached down and shook his hand and helped him get out the pool. And the other guys who were there were high-fiving each other as if, as if we're all successful, we're all winners. And yeah, wow, it was so cool. Yeah. yeah, it's such a the common humanity of it and the the um, the, the the nature of the camaraderie uh, and spirit, as you say, Stephen, is just uh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And then where where do you train, or what do you what do you do nowadays? What what's your your swimming? Right. So um, right now I'm not swimming too much because of this 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 COVID the thing, but uh, I was swimming. Um, on my own, frankly, just to mix up some swimming and running and, and some um, other things. Uh, so I belong to a club where there's a pool and I, I swim there a bit. I was up north of Toronto at a lake district uh, during the summer and uh, went out for a long swim down a channel in the middle of nowhere. And boy, I got to tell you, it was beautiful. <laughs> just, uh, I could just feel just being in the water was such a great feeling. So anyways, it's still there. Um, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of advice would you give a, a 15 year old or a 25 year old who, who goes, Hey, you know, I, I heard about this John guy. It, it seems like a fascinating career. What, what, what kind of advice would you give that individual on anything? Uh, on anything yeah. or uh, well, well, anything related to swimming? Yeah. So, um, well, I guess the, the first advice that comes to mind is look after yourself. I, I, we may not get into this, but I ended up with some injuries a um, uh, little bit later on, but um, but not not significant. They're overcome. But uh, enjoy the sport and um, do it in a way that's uh, healthy, and um, kind of optimize your human capital, optimize your you know resources, teammates, coaches. Um, uh, you know, train hard, but train skillfully, I guess, and uh, um, look for a look for a goal that's really exciting and something that you want to um, attain that might be a little beyond your your um, capacity. That's where this flow comes in, where you can really get into a space where you're you're, you're challenging yourself a little higher level, but you think it's attainable. Um, I think there's such a rush in the, in the uh, place of being in being in a place where you uh, once dreamed of, you know, so the, the success, like for me is finishing Lake Ontario. Um, I, you know, I did it and I look back and I thought, wow, I did that. And uh, it's not Lake Ontario or long swim, whatever. It's all, it's all, um, it's all relative, right? You can say, well, I've never done a one K swim before and you did it. So celebrate that, celebrate the stuff you do do, not dwell on the stuff you didn't do or you didn't make it or you didn't finish or whatever, but celebrate what you did do and really honor the effort and, and the fun and the camaraderie that exists in, in swimming. Yeah, I, I love that advice, optimizing your human capital. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, mental, cerebral, physical, you know, emotional. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. So um, I've I've been writing regularly actually about human capital, and my my definition is the um, optimization of uh, of our unique resources and uh, bringing them bringing them to bear for the for the good of all. So that's kind of a broad thing for for life, but in swimming. Yeah, so you know we've got skills, we've got coaches, we we we've got these um, ambitions, aspirations within ourselves, and uh, I would say that's our capital. And how to, you know, optimizing it is really uh, like we're built to thrive as human beings, and I think we're in that space of thriving when we're progressing, when we're growing. Um, growth is a natural state, and when we're in that place, it's really um, an invigorating place to be. So. I think that we're all capable of more than we think we are. So I guess to answer your question, the, the idea of optimizing our human capital is that uh, we are capable of a lot and um, there's a lot of enjoyment in that optimization. Um, and uh, I think that we owe it to ourselves to kind of honor that, that capacity that we have um, to, uh, to reach, reach, um, 
you know, reach goals that we want to attain. Uh, that's great. And I assume it's not age specific. So, you know, capitalizing or optimizing your human um, uh, capital doesn't just mean when you're young. It doesn't just mean when you're in middle age. It can actually yeah. happen. Well, I think you're, uh, yeah. So I really believe that um, when I used to swim, uh, you know, people know, I guess, talk about negative splitting and I think about finishing well. Um, and I think as we age, as I age, I want to finish well. I want to, might have to do it differently. Might have to think more about re rest and recovery and diet and maybe uh, not, uh, maybe remember that I'm not 27 anymore. But yeah, so uh, at any age, you know, we're, we're resilient organisms. So we can, we can heal, we can get fitter. Our heart's a muscle and um, our other muscles are, are resilient and, and, and attuned to, uh, you know, pressures that allow us to grow them. So um, yeah, at any age, I mean, uh, wow, what a, what a shame to kind of live a life at 6.2 out of 10 when we could um, strive to, you know, live at a live at a higher level and uh so my mom's 93 and she's like she needs another life because she's just busting with she just set up a facebook page to show <laughs> some pictures that she's got she's half blind but she takes amazing pictures um and she's like loves life she just is curious and excited and uh wants to live forever so uh it's kind of a mindset that you know Human capital, there's a mindset there of, of seeking to, to develop a mindset that's curious, that's open, that's, um, that's not judgmental of ourselves and allows us to be kind to ourselves so that we can feel good about things and, uh, and um, you know, be happier and less self-critical and that allows us to thrive. Wow. Great. You mentioned you you did some writing. Uh, do, you, do you have a website, a blog? Is there a book coming out? Uh, yeah. You, you have lots of wisdom there, I can tell. I just want to. Well, yeah, thanks. I, I really I really am passionate about, um, tell you what, here's the thing. I got sick from uh, too much stress, a couple of health issues. Um, I woke up one day, Stephen, I thought this is not, it can't be this way. It can't there's got to be a different way to do life. So I went through uh, rest, um, uh, fuel, eating, uh, movement, mindset, and, and uh, changed my perspective on life like profoundly. So I am writing a book. It's called uh, More Great, Less Grind. Okay, great. And uh, the idea is that um, from my experience in science, there's ways to just um, have more great in your life and less grind. And, and we, we sometimes or often are so self-critical and say things to ourselves that we never say to anybody else that, uh, do, you know, that, that grind us down and can't be great from depletion, right? Can't be, can't be that aspirational self from a, a place of depletion. But we can be if we think about how to optimize our mindset and be discerning about what thoughts we pay attention to, because most thoughts don't serve us, um, at least in my mind, um, you know, they're self-critical or they're creating barriers. But if we learn to uh, be able to think about our thoughts and uh, really choose the thoughts that help us, we can uh, redesign our mind to uh, direct us to those aspirational goals and, and existence that we want to have um, so yeah i'm writing a book i do a weekly blog on uh, human capital um, that's not yet on a website i just do it as an email um, but i'm love i really want to broaden the audience for that uh, human capital uh, i just did one today on um, basically uh, how the mind can influence the uh, body and how the body can influence the mind and and uh, and there's that connection between mind and body, which uh, we we need to be uh, alert to. Um, okay, I could keep going on this topic, but I know you've got other questions. Or no, this is great. Actually, what what I think we can do is, um, uh, if you share um, some of the topics that you've um, uh, that you've written upon and, and yeah. you share with others, that would be wonderful to share with our global swimming community wonderful 
Uh, yeah, I'd be delighted to uh, to share that with you, Stephen, and, and the uh, the Wells audience. That'd be uh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, and you know we can pick uh, a few topics where you really delve into that that theme or whatever that 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 bit of advice. It, it, this would be yeah. wonderful. Yeah, the first one I did, which I won't go into too much in detail, but the the title kind of tells it all. The title is, "It's okay to close your eyes." The idea there is that sometimes we're so driven, we think we're, we're you know warriors, tough guys and gals, and we just go 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 go. But that's not a sustainable program. So it's okay just sometimes just to close your eyes, take a deep breath, take a little micro rest, so that you can sustain that performance. Um, we're not designed to go 100% all the time. We need to rest, and it's okay to do that. It's okay to just to say, hey, I need a break. I need. I'm tired. And when we do that, we can be better for ourselves and others. So that was my first, that was my first deal. <laughs> great, great. Well, uh, the Wow's a live audience. Uh, thanks you for this part one of many to come. So Okay, well, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm really honored to be here to talk to you. I'm grateful for you reaching out, Stephen. And uh, those of you who are listening, um, you know, good luck, uh, be well, be safe, and uh, be kind to yourself and, and, uh, be kind to others in this difficult time. Great, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye.